discuss, uh, we are going to see today fetal echocardiography, the basic uh, views and some uh, fine tips. Now, as we know, uh, fetal echocardiography is more challenging than the postnatal echocardiography because it const the baby constantly varies in its position. But at the same time, we have an advantage because the lungs do not have air and the spine doesn't have calcification before 20 weeks. So lungs and spine are not barriers. Now compared to the postnatal study, the heart and fetal echo is more horizontally oriented as the lungs are dilated and the liver is large. Now it's advisable to use a curvilinear probe and we have three probes available, 3.5, 4 and 7 megahertz with a cardiac pack package if preferable. Sometimes cardiac probes can also be used especially for Doppler studies. Now we are going to see how to proceed for a fetal echo. First of all, it is important to treat the abdomen in general to make sure it is a single fetus and not a twin pregnancy. And then try to identify the lie of the fetus. See where the head and the back are. And the next important step is to establish the sidedness. Once we have decided what is right and what is left, then do a detailed segmented analysis for anatomical survey and at the end, the functional assessment. Now we'll go step by step. The first thing as we decided is, we need to know what, what is right and what is left for the baby. Now this is a very important step and a little difficult step to perform. First of all, see where the baby's head lies and where the sagittal plane of the body is located. Try to put the transducer in such a way that it lies parallel to the fetal sagittal plane, the fetal head on the right side of the screen. So as you can see in this figure, you can see that initially when we started the image, the fetal head is on the right side of the screen. In case the fetal head is on the left, you can use a right-left button in words. So once you get the fetal head on the right side of the fetal on the, of the video screen, you can, transuse, you can rotate the transducer clockwise 90 degrees so that we get a cut transverse image of the fetal thorax. You can see in this, once we have got the head on the right side of the video screen, the transducer is rotated 90 degrees clockwise and what we get is a cross section of the fetal thorax. So once we have received the cross section of the fetal thorax, we need to look at into, into this figure which helps us understand what is right and what is left based on the position of the baby. Now as you see in this figure, the first figure, the head is in the right of the video screen and the transducer was then rotated clockwise 90 degrees and a cut section of the fetal thorax was obtained. Now in this figure we can see this is anterior and this is posterior. This is the sternum and this is the spine. And then you can look at into this figure which says that this is left and this is right of the baby. And this is left and this is right. A very easy way to remember this is if you can stand in the position of the baby's heart facing the spine, your left is baby's left. We can repeat. In this once you get a cross section, you can stand in the position of the heart facing the spine. Your left will be baby's left. Or you can keep this figure next to the echo machine to decide what is right, what is left. Now once we know what is right, what is left, it becomes easier. This is just the repetition of what we say. The baby's head is on the right side of the video screen. Head on the right side of the video screen and the transfer is rotated. 90 degrees clockwise and we get a cut section. This is posterior, this is anterior. We'll wait till the image comes. This is posterior, this is anterior and you can see this is left, this is right. This is left and this is right. Now once you know what is right, what is left, it becomes more easier. After that to decide individual structures then we start our detailed anatomic survey. Make sure the position of the heart is correct. The heart sometimes could be ectopic cordy within the chest 
it could lie into the right side of the chest, left side of the chest or midline. Also important is the position of the apex of the hump, whether it is facing the right side of the chest or the left side of the chest. The next important thing is the cardiac axis. What is cardiac axis? That is the angle between two lines drawn. One line is across the interventricular septum and the other line is across the interposterior diameter of the chest. The angle between these two lines should be normally 45 degrees plus or minus 15 degrees. I can repeat, this is the angle between the interventricular septum and the enteroposterior diameter of the chest, which should be normally around 45 degrees. Any abnormality in this view in the cardiac axis points towards the heart disease, especially autotract anomalies. Now, once we are sure with the sizes, the position of the heart and the cardiac axis, we can proceed further for the analysis. Now during this study we also make sure that the stomach bubble is on the left, the apex is on the left and the descending aorta is on the left. The liver is on the right and next starts the anatomical survey of the heart. To start with what we will get in this cross section, the same section which we have made while determining the right and the left side in this, we will get a view which is very similar to a four chamber view. So we make sure that the heart is having four chambers, it's a four chamber heart and the proportion of the RV and the LV are satisfactory. In case of doubt, we can have absolute measurements of the chambers measured at the tip of the leaflet during endiastole and there are charts available to compare. Start from the top, make sure the pulmonary veins are entering into LA on 2D and the LA doesn't appear blank. The crux of the heart is an important structure in this view where we need to see the interatrial septum, the interventricular septum and the septal leaflet of the AV valve. The offset is important. The difference between the septal attachment of the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve is different because the tricuspid valve is closer to the apex. When you don't have this offset, be a little careful to check for AV septal defects. The single, there should be a single vessel behind the heart. This is a principle and this is the descending aorta which you can see in this view. So in this view, make sure you have the descending aorta, apex and stomach bubble on the same side. This is what will give you an idea about the visceral situs, the atrial situs and the gross anatomy of the heart. Now once we go um, in the same four chamber, put color and make sure you can see at least two pulmonary veins entering into the left atrium and the AV valves are completely painted and there is no regurgitation, especially tricuspid regurgitation which is important to check in early gestation. The second most important thing is the interatrial septal defect which is unrestricted flowing from right to left and the slap is slapping into the left atrium. Once we are done with the four chambers, we can sweep anteriorly to open up the left ventricular outflow tract and the right ventricular outflow tract. Crossing great arteries are important for us. If you don't see great arteries crossing, it is always abnormal, malposition of great vessels. You may be fortunate sometimes to open up the branch pulmonary arteries in this view. Now throughout this screening, just keep an eye on the interventricular septum and make sure there are no VSDs. Sometimes in four chamber view, you might see false defects in the membranous septum for which a parasol long axis is more important. Additional muscular VSDs might be important, but you could try to see a sizable defect in this view. The ratio between pulmonary artery and aorta is important and normally the pulmonary artery is bigger than the aorta with a mean ratio of approximately 1.1 is to 1. The maximum acceptable is 1.2 is to 1. That means the bummy artery can be maximum 1.2 times the size of aorta. In case you find a discrepancy where the bummy artery is much bigger, it could be because of developing coarctation 
or a substrate of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And if this ratio is less, that means the aorta is bigger, you could be dealing with pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary atresia, etc. Now, from this view, we need to sweep across again the sagittal plane of the body and to get a cut, a sagittal cut of the heart, which is very similar to our subcostal sagittal view. And you will open up the SVC and the IVC, which is raining into the interior atrium. The posterior atrium, which is close to the spine of the left atrium, as you can see the flap entering into the left atrium. And hence this signs that the atrial sinus is okay and the systemic venous drainage is okay. The IVC is not interrupted and the internal atrial septal defect is unrestricted. You can have a little modified view where you can also see SPC IVC view. And this view is important, we will see a little later for the three vessel view in fetal echo. Once we have, we have done with that, we can sweep a little more. And we will see the outflow tract in this view. This is the left ventricle and this is the right ventricular outflow tract. And the same thing can be checked on color to make sure there are no ventricular septal defects and the outflow tracts are patent. Now from this view, we need to go back to the four chamber and modify it in such a way that we have the cut across the long axis of the heart. This will give you a peristinal long axis sort of a view where we can see LVOT in its length, mitral and aortic continuity. This view is important to make sure there is aortic mitral continuity and also PSD in the membranous subaortic area. The same thing is checked on color and from this view, this is similar to peristinal long axis and if you rotate 90 degrees from here, what we will get is like a parasimal short axis. So in the first image you can see this is exactly 90 degrees rotation from the previous view. You get aorta in its short axis and you can see the branch PA bifurcating the LA, RA and the RVOT. VSP can be well defined in this view later part in gestation. And a little modification from this, a little tilt from here will open up the ductal arch which continues as descending aorta. So you can see in this figure, this is the right ventricular output tract, branch PA and the descending aorta, this connection is the ductal arch. Now coming to the arches, which is one important aspect of fetal echo, the ductal and the aortic arches need to be seen separately. The ductal arch is like an ice hockey stick. It is much more stouter and it starts from anteriorly and continues the descending aorta. It doesn't give rise to arch vessels. The velocity of ductal arch is always higher than the aortic arch. The aortic arch is like a candy stick and you can see it arises just next to the SVC and it gives rise to arch vessels and continues the descending aorta. So here you can see it comes just next to the SVC. This is the right pulmonary artery in cross section. It takes the turn and it gives rise to arch vessels. And the isthmic part of the aortic arch is important because this is the only way you can pick up isthmic coarctation in fetal life. An indirect way to have a suspicion for isthmic coarct is unexplained right heart dilatation. But on 2D it is important to see the isthmic area of the aortic arch. I hope it's clear so far. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Now coming to one of the important aspects of fetal echo, which is the three vessel view. The three vessel view shows the SVC, the aorta and the pulmonary artery. As we saw a couple of slides before, when you are in subcostal sagittal plane of the baby, where you open up the SVC, IVC, a little tilting of the probe, you will see all three vessels together, the SVC, aorta and the pulmonary artery in section. 
the SVC is smaller than the aorta and the aorta is smaller than the pulmonary artery. If there is any discrepancy in the sizes, it indicates we are dealing with a heart disease. A free vessel view is normally even performed by radiologists based on which they suspect a heart problem. The one important thing which we have not touched so far is the sidedness of the arch. Now we can see in the first figure, normally this is how the SPC, aorta and pulmonary artery are related. This is anterior and this is posterior. And as we know, the aorta goes from the right to the left side in the trachea is situated here. In case there is right aortic arch, the aorta stays on the right side and the trachea is in between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. This is a way to suspect right aortic arch where you should be more careful to look for additional heart diseases. Now this was about the anatomical survey of the heart. We are coming to the third part of fetal echo, which includes function and rhythm. Now in general, the cardiothoracic ratio should be 1 is to 2. That means the heart should be approximately 50% occupying the thoracic cavity. And dimensions, standard charts are available for individual valve measurements, as in aorta, main pulmonary artery and ventricular dimensions. As we already saw, the measurements of the ventricles should be taken as a level of valve at the end of diastole. For the rhythm, we need to measure the atrial rate, the ventricular rate, and check for the atrioventricular relationship. And this can be done using Dopplers or M modes. Doppler of aorta and SCC or left ventricular inflow and outflow Dopplers can be used. M mode of aorta and LV or LA and LV can also be used. This uh, class, we are not going to go into the detail of rhythm disturbances. But I would like to say that there are few dropplers which we need to do for a completion sake in fetal echo. Some of, some of which are prognosticating for um, placental insufficiency and some of which can also indicate associated chromosomal problems. First of all, we'll start with the umbilical artery doppler. Now, umbilical artery has its own length starting from the placenta closer to the fetus. And it should be doppled at both the points closer to the baby and closer to the placenta. But it's more accurate at placenta insertion. As we can see in this figure, we have the systolic flow which is more prominent and there is a continuous prograde diastolic flow present. But this is how the flow is during later gestation. During earlier gestation, if diastolic flow is not there, it is still normal. But in later gestation, if the diastolic flow is not there, it indicates increased placental resistance. Now for umbilical artery, there are few scores indices which have to be also measured. The first is the pulsatility index, which can be measured manually or the machine can calculate with the software is instilled. It is basically the peak systolic minus the diastolic velocity divided by the mean velocity. And the second index is the resistance index, which is systolic velocity minus the diastolic velocity divided by systolic velocity. So as we can see in this figure, we have the pulsatility and the resistance index, and it changes based on the gestational period, and there are charts available for this. The next important thing is the systolic by diastolic ratio. And as we can see, the SC ratio, it decreases with gestational age. Because initially there is no diastolic flow, over time the diastolic flow comes and hence the S by D ratio decreases. But in case you have high S by D ratios later in gestation, it in indicates that you have increased vascular resistance, the baby could be IUGR. And in case there is a reversal of the diastolic flow, it indicates there is impending IUD. This can also happen in hydrox as we understand when there is significant systolic pressure, uh, significant back pressure changes. Now this is regarding the umbilical artery and uh, normograms are available for umbilical artery doctors which should be looked carefully. Then the next is the umbilical vein in the umbilical cord. Now it's a venous structure, it has a continuous prograde flow and as we understand this is 
SD wave sort of a venous wave and usually there is no reversal during atrial contraction as we can see in normal IVC hepatic vein Doppler, we do not see it in umbilical venous Doppler. In case it is present, it is not normal and it indicates congestive cardiac failure. Also, normally it's a venous structure, but if you happen to see pulsation into the venous structure later in gestation, also it is considered an ominous sign. Sometimes you might get the venous in the arterial Doppler, which most of the times happens this way. So this is the umbilical venous Doppler, and the next is ductus arteriosus. Now as we say when you open up the ductal arch we need to doppler that and the ductus arteriosus doppler usually is a little higher as we discussed before. It has systolic and continuous diastolic flow. So this is a little similar to the umbilical artery flow and uh, ductus arteriosus we have velocities which are acceptable. If it exceeds also it is not normal because ductus arteriosus can get constricted because of if the mother is on tocolytic flight, endometastin, NSAIDs or turbitulin. And uh, if the ductal constriction is happening, the in systolic and the diastolic velocities will be increased. And this tracing will look very similar to a coart tracing. And hence dopplering ductus arteriosus is important. Now coming to the next structure which is the ductus venosus. That's the synopsis you would open up in the same subcostal SPC, uh, the dietary view, SPC IVC view, and you could see a turbulent flow which is very close to the right atrium. And this that's the synopsis Doppler normally has a prograde through systole and diastole flow. In case the A wave is negative, it indicates congestive cardiac failure and sometimes also an abnormal karyotype. The ductus venosus velocity is very similar to a venous flow, but it has only prograde flow. It doesn't have a negative A wave. Now IVC, which is uh, a similar to postnatal IVC Doppler, however, early in gestation, the A wave accounts for 25 to 40 percent of the total flow. As you can see, the S, D, and the A wave. Later in gestation, if this A wave velocity is much more that during atrial contraction, if this velocity is much more, it indicates fetal compromise. Now the next important thing is atrioventricular valve and we need to understand that before, early in gestation, usually we do not perform fetal patterning, but it is a monophasic pattern of uh, Doppler and over nine, by nine weeks to develop separate E and A waves where the E wave is Lesser than the A wave in velocity, which continues till term and at term the E wave becomes more prominent than the A wave. Overall, by 11 weeks of gestation, the tricuspid valve dopplers are higher. The velocities are higher than the mitral valve in through dopplers, which continues throughout gestation. Any amount of PR is it abnormal? Especially when it's seen in earlier part of gestation, it is controversial, but most of the people would say that it is a marker of chromosomal defect. The pulmonary veins are extremely difficult to get, but sometimes later in gestation, some amount of venous flow can be appreciated. And it's like any venous flow where we see S and D waves, but no A waves for pulmonary veins because the capacitance of the pulmonary venous system is lesser and the A wave appears and D wave decreases, then it indicates the LA pressures are high. So it's usually S and D wave and in case A wave is seen, it is abnormal. Now the last thing in doctor's study we need to know is the uterine artery. The uterine artery is so can be obtained in the right and the left iliac fossa and it's the artery which runs exactly perpendicular to the external iliac artery. So if you put a probe in the iliac fossa parallel to the inguinal ligament, you will see the uterine artery and the ideal age to screen this uterine artery is 24 to 36 weeks. Both the right and left sided uterine arteries should be separately screened and as we see we can see a systolic flow and a continuous diastolic flow. Now in case you see a dip during the diastole, it is called a diastolic notch, which is very similar to increased resistance index in uterine artery and it again indicates that there, is, there are chances the baby will develop IUGR or severe complications of 
pregnancy where the gynecologist might prefer to start as the rest. Now this is regarding the doctor's study. I think we have ended our talk and I would ask if there are any questions I would be happy. If you want to go back to any of the slides we can do that.